Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Freeston. I am Director of Quality Improvement at the Early Years Alliance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, Welcome Back, Opening Up of Childminding Provision. I'm delighted to be joined on this evening's session by Melanie Pilcher, Quality and Standards Manager at the Early Years Alliance. Hello, everybody. Um, Sarah Neville from Nuts for Childminding. Hi, everyone. And, um, and Heidi Stewart, um, a childminder from Tunbridge Wells. Hi, everybody. Um, I will ask them to introduce themselves in a bit more detail as we go through the, today's um, presentation. Um, just a word about how we're going to operate. Um, we have a short presentation, which Melanie will lead on, um, which will give you an overview of the guidance, um, which has been presented by government for childminding provision. Um, we will then give con some consideration to some of the interpretation of that guidance and what we feel it may, uh, what impact it will have on your provision. But the main focus of today's session is a panel discussion form furnished by questions from yourselves, uh, which is my role to try and feed into the panellists. Um, now, that can get quite tense at times because they're coming in already onto my screen. So what I will try and do is feed those in either during Mel Melanie's presentation or to the individual panelists. I apologize in advance if the sheer number and volume means that um, I don't get to your particular question, but we do keep track of them all and we will be able to um, respond to uh, themes of questions on the Early Years Alliance's Q&A site on, the, on our website. Um, finally, um, if all goes terribly wrong with the Wi-Fi and recognising that it's six till seven in the evening and therefore could be very popular with um, people streaming, um, what we will do is if, if, we, if everything went terribly wrong now, we would record a, a private session of the session um, and either way, this will be posted onto the Early Years Alliance's YouTube page, which you can access off the homepage of our Early Years, um, Early Years Alliance website. Right, that's all by way of introduction from me. I shall hand over to Melanie and I shall start to try and um, work through the questions as they're coming in. That's great. Thank you very much, Michael. And hello again to everybody out there. Um, Michael's explained a little bit about the aims of the session today. Um, I now have control of the slides, so I will take you through the next five or ten minutes just talking about some of the policy and some of the practicalities before we actually go on to a more open discussion. So, as Michael mentioned earlier, we are looking at the government's guidance relating to the opening up of child mining provision as we move out of lockdown. And of course, very much concentrating on what we know now, because the guidance is constantly being updated, as you will know full well. Um, we're going to consider the practicalities that child minders will need to address to reopen their provision, which is why we are absolutely delighted today to be joined by two very experienced child minders um, who, who will actually help to steer and um, actually inform those discussions. And most importantly, as Michael said earlier, to share the experiences of you, those of you who have continued to operate children and the children of essential workers during lockdown and of course those of you who are now thinking about the steps you're going to need to take over the coming weeks. Now if you bear with me I seem to have some sticky keys for moving the slides on so just bear with me. Okay, so if we come on now to who we are, and the first person that pops up on our screen is Heidi. So over to you, Heidi, to tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Heidi. I'm a childminder who works alone. I've never had assistance with me. I've always worked as a one-man band. I live in a small village in the Kent countryside. Um, I've been childminding since the summer of 2007. And since 2012, I've retained an outstanding grade 
Um, the most being the, re the most recent being this past February. So it was done under the new statutory framework. Not as scary as people think it may be. It was certainly easier for me. Um, my roles in the childminded community have included being part of the quality assurance scheme, which was set out by my local authority. I've sat as an independent representative on Ofsted scrutiny panels, and I'm one of four ladies who are admin on a national childminder hub Facebook group, um, which we help sort of have a chat and help our members with questions and answers, um, etc. So yeah, that, that's all about me. Thank you very much, Heidi, um, and I'd love to pick your brains at some point about your experiences um, under the new framework as well. So thank you for sharing that. Right, <laughs> again, I've got these sticky keys, but I'm trying to move us on. Got a problem, Mel? Money. It just seems that the slides don't want to move on for me. I, I don't know is. why. So uh, I'm pressing the arrow your, keys. Um, yeah, so the arrow keys is usually what does it. Um, if you use your mouse onto the toolbar, it might have gone off. I can see your mouse is moving around. Just click onto the slide and then um, see if that brings up the arrow key, if the arrow keys respond. Uh -huh. yeah, right, okay, so sorry about that, everybody. Right, Sarah, after that delay, um, over to you. Let's hear a little bit about you, please. Hi, everyone. That's me at my Christmas party last year. We don't have much Christmas parties, do we, as childminders? So we went out to a local hotel. My name's Sarah Neville. I've been childminding 26 years. I currently work, I worked a long time by myself, but I currently work with my husband and we have an assistant. So we normally have between six and 10 children a day until the 23rd of March when everything stopped. I'm a representative on the Ofsted Big Conversation Northwest Steering Group. So I get to meet with Ofsted quite regularly and to discuss childminding issues there. I'm an admin on the Independent Childminders Facebook group. I do a lot of writing, consultancy and training as well with childcare.co.uk and personally, privately going out to see childminders. I feel very privileged when I go into childminder homes and they invite me in and we have a look at what they're doing. I think it's a wonderful part of my job and it's just great, isn't it, childminding? It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant, Sarah. Thank you very much for such a positive introduction. Right, I'm going to try and move on again. OK, and this is me. Um, I don't look quite like that at the moment. I look a little bit more frazzled, I must say. Um, my name is Melanie Pilcher. I'm the Quality Standards Manager for the Early Years Alliance. I work in the Quality Improvement Team, the QI team, I like to think of myself as um, the Sandy Toxvig of the Early Years Alliance. Um, I primarily create resources for the sector, uh, speak at conferences, um, write publications, articles in our own um, Under Five magazine and for other trade press. So a very diverse role. Um, in previous life I have worked quite closely with childminders but things have moved on greatly over my career. So that's me, and I'm going to try now to hand you over to Michael Freeston. Hi there, thanks, Melanie. Um, I'm Michael Freeston, Director of Quality Improvement. I'm focusing on the questions, and two that I'll take now, if you don't mind. First of all, somebody has said they had a problem with the sound. Now, is that their issue or ours? If you can hear, can you still just put your hands up again, or otherwise, I'm starting to get really frustrated if if uh, hopefully that's the individual themselves. Um, normally people type in if there is a problem, so I hope that's OK. Yes. Um, and the other one is I should have said at the outset, yes, we will send out copies of the slides to everybody who is registered for the session. That probably won't be until tomorrow, but don't feel as though you have to try and write everything down. Um, uh, we will cover those um, those bits as we go forward. That's probably all you need from me. Other than to say, I'm taking loads of questions now so I can feed them into the panel. If I don't mention your name, it's because I've written them down and scrolled further down the screen. So I apologise for that, but thank you for the questions. 
That's brilliant. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so moving on then, um, I just thought it was really important that we actually refer to the, the sources from which we've drawn the information from for tonight's um, presentation. And most of you will be familiar by now with the documents that are up on the screen. If you haven't, the links are there. And when um, you should be able to, to click on these links live if we send you a copy of the presentation. Um, you will see at the bottom, we are awaiting with bated breath some further guidance from the government. We were expecting it yesterday, it didn't come out yesterday, hasn't come out as yet today, but we are waiting on further guidance. Uh, I did see a tweet from, I think it's Paul War from The Independent, that they have, number 10 have said it will be published tomorrow. However, as one of the questions said, is there going to be specific early years guidance? And mm -hmm. I do not expect that to be the case. One of the things that has been interesting is clearly we are now seen as part of the education system. So when there is guidance for um, education and childcare, we're put into the same. Whether there is specific details within it, um, we shall see from tomorrow. Thank you, Michael. And um, yes, yeah, so, and just to say on that note as well, if you haven't signed up for, for the DfE alerts, then it's a really good idea to do so, so that you get these alerts straight to your inbox as soon as they come in. Um, and just do that on dfe.gov.uk and uh, it will take you to the section where you just sign up for any alerts and then you actually filter out those that you're interested in, so schools, further education and so on, and early years, you just filter out the ones that you want. Um, obviously, more importantly than ever, as the experiences and the advice from childminders have remained open during seven weeks of lockdown so far, and we've had a lot of connect events around the country so far, and we've been able to talk to childminders and really started to gather a lot of information, a lot of frequently asked questions. And in fact, a lot of things that we've been able to feed back directly to the DfE as well. So where there has been confusion, where sometimes there's been conflicting information that's coming out, we've actually been able to address that with the DfE um, at the soonest opportunity. And of course, most importantly, your comments and your questions tonight. Um, what I want to say is that we will not be providing all the answers because simply because as yet there are none. We're all in a, a we're all feeling our way with this, and including policymakers. And whilst it is cliched to say it, I'm afraid the fact is that we are in an unprecedented situation. So hopefully tonight we will get some clarity, we will share experience. And we will take information back from you that we can keep feeding back to the government as well. So um, I think it was just over a week ago now in the, in the Prime Minister's speech, he actually said, we therefore anticipate with further progress that we may be able to, from the week commencing the 1st of June 2020, welcome back more children to early years, school, and further education settings. We will only do this provided that the five key tests set out by government justify the changes at the time, including that the rate of infection is decreasing and the enabling programmes set out in the roadmap are operating effectively. And he also went on to say that whilst we want to get all children and young people back into education as soon as the scientific advice allows, because it is the best place for them to learn and because we know how important it is for their mental well-being to have those social interactions with their peers, their carers and teachers. Children returning to educational and childcare settings in greater numbers will allow more families to return to work. So we get a real insight there into the government's rationale for actually working towards the 1st of June for reopening. When we look specifically at childminding guidance, um, we, we have a little bit more information to align with the government's position on nannies. We are updating our guidance for early years settings to confirm that paid childcare can be provided to the children of one household from Wednesday the 13th of May. 
This includes childminders who may choose to look after the children of one household if they are not already looking after vulnerable children or those of critical workers. And the link that we put at the bottom of the slide takes you directly to that guidance. And we've already received over the past week um, a lot of questions about that. And actually, the DfE did go on to clarify that further as per the statement that you will see in front of you. Again, in the guidance, we look at what we're being asked to consider. So this is taken again directly from government guidance. And we've highlighted the bits that are particularly relevant to us in early years. The guidance states that demand for childcare is likely to be lower than usual at first. So some of you will already be putting the feelers out to parents and will possibly have some idea already of those who will be requiring a space. It also states that where the physical layout of the setting does not allow small groups of children to be kept at a safe distance apart, we expect practitioners to exercise their judgment in ensuring the highest standards of safety are maintained. And I think what this is saying really is that acknowledgement that social distancing in an early years context is nigh on impossible. So we look at the other means by which we can actually reduce the spread of infection. We're all very good at infection control measures in our, in our homes and in our settings. From the 1st of June 2020, childminders can look after children of all ages in with their usual limits on the number of children they can care for. I talked earlier about the science and actually the government did publish the science that they have used in order to, um, to actually uh, to underpin their thinking on the reopening and getting back to, um, to normal. The science tells us that um, the severity of disease in children, there is a high scientific confidence that children of all ages have less severe symptoms than adults if they contract coronavirus. We're told that the age of children uh, with a younger child, there is a moderately high scientific confidence that younger children are less likely to become unwell if infected with coronavirus. The numbers of children going back, we're told, need to be limited initially and increase gradually as the science permits. And that goes back to that idea of we're learning as we go along. Systems to reduce the size of the groups coming into contact with each other, such as smaller class sizes spread out across settings will make a difference. But of course, we have to acknowledge not only the parental anxieties over returning, but also the anxieties that you yourselves are having at the moment, which again is the sort of thing that we can be discussing as we go through the slides. Some key considerations for childminders, again, these are taken directly from the government document. So which children are we going to prioritise? And we hear about children who are clinically vulnerable and clinically, sorry, the households who are clinically vulnerable and with clinically extremely vulnerable households. So if a child or young person or a staff member lives in a household with somebody who is extremely clinically vulnerable, and that's set out in the guidance on shielding, it's advised they only attend an educational or childcare setting if stringent social distancing can be adhered to. And in the case of children, if they are all able to understand and follow those instructions. So we can see already how that possibly limits some of the children that we can actually take back and welcome back into our settings. We also talk about anybody who's symptomatic, who might be self-isolating. We've got the considerations for um, essential workers, how we can offer places and prioritise places. Firstly, to any um, vulnerable children or uh, children of essential workers that we're already offering places for. If we're not, these are the ones that we should be prioritizing on the return to your home. Then parents who cannot work from home 
and then three and four year olds and then younger children. So they, these are the suggested order of prioritizing the places as you organize yourselves and as you consider returning. Then for you, the consideration again, how many children, how you can actually organize your home so that children, obviously grouping children in separate groups is not an issue because you are caring for one group of children. Risk assessments, there is a requirement that everybody undertakes a risk assessment before reopening. Your own workload and your well-being as well, because key to everything is how you are, how you're managing, because if we're not okay, then we can't be there for those children and families that need us. There's a little bit about just, just, just one question that came in when you mentioned risk assessments there. Somebody um, wrote in, it was Sarah, does it have to be a written risk assessment? I just thought I'd put that one in as it popped up just as you were pausing. That's a really good question because of course childminders, well actually earlier settings don't necessarily have to have written risk assessment. But my advice would be that actually in this instance, um, a written risk assessment is going to help you and it's going to be reassuring as well that you can actually show this to parents who might have concerns about returning and in the we'll talk later about the welcome backpack for childminders that we're putting together and mm -hmm. I've included a risk assessment template in there so I would suggest to you that yes a written risk assessment is a good idea um, and when we move on perhaps we can ask, ask Heidi and Sarah um, what their intentions are with that as well. Okay, thank um, you. Your own workload and well-being again will be addressed in the welcome backpack, some of the things that you need to think about for yourself. Of course it's mental health week this week isn't it and um, you know as carers we are so busy caring for everybody else that we very often forget about ourselves so it's a time just to remind yourselves of the importance of you. Transport, those of you that collect children or deliver children um, as part of your wraparound service, those are considerations that the government wants you to think about carefully. Food, um, if any of you do have food from outside sources, how are you going to manage that? But I'm again, I will assume that childminders prepare food on their premises, although I believe that some childminders will order food in and use a particular service. And the considerations for wraparound care and share provision, which we are actually still waiting for some clarity on now, but I've got a feeling that's what going to be a hot potato. Um, oh, half the questions coming in. I will start with that when we move on to the questions, Melanie. Thank you. Excellent. OK, thank you, Michael. Oh, thank you. And just moving on uh, again, looking at some of the guidance, this is a particular area of interest to myself as somebody who, is, who specializes in early years, um, policy, health and safety and infection control. PPE, including face coverings and face mask. Um, we, we do get a lot of questions about this. Um, I don't know if any have come in so far, Michael, but I will just say in response to anybody that asks, I heard it I think it was today I heard, no, yesterday I heard from a childminder who actually said, I've been told or I've heard that we will have to wear head to foot PPE. And <laughs> yes, uh, I'd, like to reassure, I'd like to reassure, I can hear Sarah and Heidi there that haven't been able to restrain themselves, but I, I have to reassure you, this is not the case you should continue to use the PPE that you currently use. By PPE we mean the gloves, the aprons that maybe you currently use for nappy changing and for intimate care and so on. You should have a supply of face masks available simply in case you have to uh, deal with a child who suddenly starts to show symptoms. So that would be the time when you would perhaps use a face covering, a face mask. Some of the other protective measures that we talk about, risk assessments and so on, we've mentioned some other considerations there, but I'll just come down to the last one, which is about the soft burnishing, soft toys and toys that are hard to clean um, being removed. And again, the challenge is for you. You know, I can't see anybody dragging their three piece suite out into the back garden um, <laughs> whilst the child, children come in. So again, these are all challenges. These are all things that we're going to have to think about really carefully. 
So some of the things, the questions that have popped in, I'm going to hand back over to Michael now. I've got a feeling that you will already have a heap of questions that you're ready to go uh, with, Michael. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing furiously here. Thank you, uh, Melanie. Um, I think on the slide, I'm, the, the questions are in front of my screen. Is it, is it, am I correct in thinking that the next slide is one to just, is a series of issues that have been raised already in previous discussions? Yes, these um, are. These are on here now. Like, I, if you don't mind, I will leave those because I'll go straight to the okay. ones that have come in. And Absolutely. I'm going to start. If I'm going to start, if you don't mind, um, and it's particularly one for Sarah because I know this is pertinent to you, if you don't mind. In terms of, there's two elements. One is children who attend more than one setting, and the issue either that's during the day or doing wraparound care with um, with schools drop on, etc. Can you talk us through your uh, the conversations you've been having with your local authority about that? Hi. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. I've spoken to both Ofsted and my local and local authorities generally about about this, and there isn't one clear path for us to take, unfortunately. Pending more guidance from Department for Education, which may or may not talk about this, there is nothing in the Ofsted legislation in the department. Sorry, in the EYFS to stop us doing it, but unfortunately, local authorities seem to be making local decisions, which are preventing childminders and out-of-school clubs from collecting from other settings. They're saying they don't want childminders with buggies or childminders with other children in playgrounds. They're saying the children should stay at school all day because they are safer there. And I'm putting those two words in inverted commas. So until we have further guidance, we simply do not have a definitive answer, except contact your local school, see what their policy is. Thank you. Um, Heidi, what's the situation that you've picked up around uh, wrap around in more than one setting? Uh, well, mine's been a slightly more positive. The school that I collect from are quite happy from me for me to collect my two key worker children. Um, and also the local schools in my area actually got together and split the care between three school buildings so that three schools were attending one building at a time. Um, social socially distanced was adhered to. They each had separate classrooms, separate areas in the playground. Um, and as a personally, as a childminder, I do not want to have to stop looking after my key worker children come the first of June if I allow other people into my home. So um, by talking to my parents, and um, they've all been very understanding, and I've managed to be able to change the hours slightly for the younger children so that the key worker children are actually still here on their own. Um, but no, I haven't had any negative response um, collecting from the different schools at all. Um, Michael, if I can just yes, give in as well on this one. Um, it, it seems to me listening to both Sarah and to Heidi that this, you know, where this is part of the school's risk assessment and part of the childminders risk assessment, this is something that obviously some schools feel they can manage using that risk assessment approach. OK, thank you. Um, in terms of the, a couple of questions, I'm going to try and link these together. So there was a question in terms of what do we mean? But well, this, the, 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 the reference to bubbles of children first and terms, first of all, in terms of um, what is a small group? Is there any definition? Then whether the, the childminders own children is included in that head count of a bubble, which I think is interesting. Uh, and also, what, how is that impacted if you have a child minding assistance? So as it's got the reference to the assistance as well, I'll come to Sarah first, if you don't mind, Sarah. Thank you. The Department for Education used the word group or cohort and the colloquialism of bubble. I think yes. it's called bubble a colloquialism. A bubble refers to within a school setting 15 children. And our current understanding is that they're transferring that number over to early years. But until we've got the new guidance, we can't be absolutely sure about that. But the EYFS um, ratios still apply. Absolutely, um, yes. So 15 would be if you had an assistant, I'm assuming, is that correct? Well, yeah, we have 10, 12 some days yeah. here. There's two staff and an assistant. So yes, it would. there, there are child um, mining settings with three child minders, for example. 
as well. And, and you would have well, six, it's... twelve, eighteen. So they would then be over their bubble if it was fifteen. Michael. Yes, it's Melanie. Just saying that some local authorities um, are actually suggesting that settings, and I would imagine that Child Minds is included in this, actually double the space available uh, requirements in the EYFS. Now, where that can only be a suggestion because it's not a statutory requirement, but I just wanted to flag that up and I'd be interested to hear if anybody else has heard that. Thank no, you. No, I haven't and I'm not sure how I'd stretch my house. No, no, I'm not sure. Short of building an extension, we should I don't think that's feasible. <laughs> <laughs> um, Heidi, uh, if I can come to you, uh, it's an inter just from having been open, as as you both have. Somebody's asked the question in terms of uh, your experience and knowledge of the transition risks of transfer of the virus from uh, from children to adults, particularly was the question, but also how you've gone about reassuring parents of that your provision is safe. Um, okay, thank you. Yes, well, I did set out a risk assessment before I took on the key worker children um, and I realised that obviously parents are going to be just as worried for them coming into my home as I am of, of the opposite way around. Um, from my experience, I mean, the children I've looked after are slightly older, so they are therefore they're a bit more aware of the hygiene procedures needed. So they've been very good at washing hands. They understand that they have to count to 20 and they understand that it happens frequently. Um, I have managed to set up a little station outside where they keep their bags and their shoes and their coats so they're not actually brought into the house. Um, and I do make use of my outside space as much as possible. Um, but no stringent hygiene, um, not bringing items into my home from their homes or from their school, um, and that's how I've managed so far. Thank you. Um, the reference there, I, I can imagine, I can't see Melanie, but I know she's chomping at the bit with that reference to outdoors. Melanie, do you want to um, come in? <laughs> yes, please. Um, I'm, Michael knows I'm a huge advocate for outdoor learning, outdoor experiences, forest schools and so on. And I think this is a real time that we can take the bull by the horns and actually make the best use of outdoors because, you know, the department have said, have your windows open in your setting. Um, <laughs> Yeah, outdoors more. I'd say close the windows, go outdoors and stay outdoors as much as you possibly can. So that's all I wanted to say on that one. If I, if I could just say something on that point, there was a, a statement released, I can't remember exactly where it came from, but the um, statement was saying that childminders were not allowed to take childminded children out of their private space. So um, it was advised that we were kept within our gardens. Now, of course, not everybody has a garden, so that's a very mm -hmm. difficult thing to follow. Um, I'm very fortunate in that I have open fields and orchards directly behind my house. So I have been taking my children out for their daily exercise with parental permission. Um, I ensured I got parental permission before I did that. And, you know, it's easy to adhere to social distancing when you've got, a you know, an acre sized yeah. field. Um, but there was there was some concern because childminders were told we could not leave our private space, which I felt was very unfair. Was that, the was that the local authority? Um, I'm not quite sure. So I think Sarah, did you mention that to me that you'd seen it somewhere as well? Hi. Yeah, it was it was in the original government guidance. However, since that, I have spoken to Ofsted and they are perfectly happy with us going on yes. outings as long as we're sensible and we social distance. Yeah. So well, I think if we don't take Thank you. Tesco, um, that, we can take that would just be against or whatever or a reward or whatever. Um, just building on from that, the, the link in terms of who's giving the instructions, we had one question and it was from Helen. Can the local authority insist on the number of children you have? Um, I'm wondering what the people have picked up around that, Melanie, um, uh, if, if there's anything that's coming to the Alliance or if it's, if Heidi, yeah. if that's anything you've picked up. I, I um, would say, first off, I would say that, um, that, that the local authority would have to have a very good reason for doing that because w we know that the EYFS still applies. And the only changes that can be made to that or should be made are those that are already in the disapplications and modifications to the EYFS. So personally, I haven't heard that, and I would imagine that would 
be hard for local authorities to do. But going back to Heidi or Sarah, I think you were going to pick up on this. I'll hand back over to you on that one. Um, yes, I think the local authority, to, in my mind, the local authority can't really dictate how you run your childminding business unless funded children are concerned. But certainly Ofsted and the EYFS is very clear on ratios. And it has been said, you know, from both of them, you have to remain within your ratio, um, which of course is going to cause problems for some childminders who have their own children at home during the day because they're not able to go to school um, because they're outside the year groups that are being accepted back. Mm. And just on that, just to clarify that the EYFS does allow for exceptions to be made in exceptional circumstances. So I think, again, this comes back to you and how you you make your justification for this. Um, and bearing in mind, this is one of the things that we've been reminded um, in early years that that provision is there to make exceptions to the ratios, but in exceptional circumstances. And we must okay, never go you. over six under eight. Yeah, never, yeah, ever sorry. six over eight, never. Ever. Never. Um, no. Just one question that came in, and this isn't a standard procedural thing, but I'm just curious if to anybody's picked it up. Is the lo are any local authorities providing PPE, or is it up to individuals to source themselves? So just to know, um, um, Sarah, I'm sorry, Heidi, if I come to you first, is, is there anything you picked up? Um, I have certainly picked up on several groups, Facebook groups that I belong to. Some local authorities authorities have indeed provided childminders with a pack. Um, personally, my local authority hasn't, but I do know of childminders who have received, but it's a very basic sort of apron, mask, and a couple of pairs of gloves. Right, thank and, you. And, and Michael, just to say in the guidance, it does state um, in the early years guidance that anybody that's having trouble sourcing PPE through their usual supplies, and actually get in touch and I'm thinking off the top of my head I think it's something called the local supply forum through your local authority so if you're having trouble sourcing PPE through your usual supplies do get in touch with your local authority they may be able to help. Okay um, I'm going to ask a specific question now it came in from Catherine uh, uh, um, just just after we started but I think is a, there's a specific answer which uh, if you don't mind I'll, I'll come to Heidi first on but I think it opens up the issue of how you get the children to your provision. Her, Catherine's situation is this I have a family who cannot collect their child due to dad not driving Granddad usually picks up, but is not part of their household, so therefore cannot collect. Can I drive them home? Heidi, you in the first instance. Um, personally, I would say yes, as long as you did not have any other children in the car with you. Um, I mean, obviously, I drive to the school that I collect from because it's five miles away. It's not a local primary school that they go to. Um, and I have indeed done that in the past. Um, but if you can provide, uh, you know, and be aware that you will have to wipe down the car seats, the handles, if you can stick to one car seat, you know, in the same part of the car, all that kind of thing. If you think that you can uh, manage what it takes to be able to make that a as risk free as possible to do, then yes, I don't see why not. There's nothing to say you can't. Thank you. Sarah, anything to add? There was an assistant question earlier I didn't answer, Michael. Can you remember what the uh, wording was on that? It was in terms of uh, yeah, it was in terms of the definition of small groups, and I think we we probably uh, we covered it in terms of the ratio mm -hmm. discussion. Um, because my thought on assistance was I wouldn't recommend if someone can work without them at the moment. It's bringing another family, possibly right. with another child, into their bubble. So my recommendation no, on that was going point. to be you. if you can do without it, I wouldn't do it just now. Okay, thank you. As far um, as cars, no, I'm not taking anyone in my car. Sorry. No, no, no. Please, if there's anything particularly, Sarah, on the transport um, issue, um, please We've got comment. no advice at all. There is some advice for taxis, which people might find useful if you go on to say the Salford Taxi Company or something. There, mm -hmm. there are advice. There is some sort of how to people keep people safe in cars advice there. Sort and Michael. Yes, um, Melanie. Uh, just mention as well that there is apparently something called an air conditioning bomb don't be alarmed but it is a means by which you can actually put something through your air conditioning system that will actually sterilize or disinfect your your vehicle 
um, but I'm afraid I know little more than it does exist. Right, Ooh. okay, that's something that we can investigate. I now can't find the question that somebody asked about parents bringing food in for their children. So whoever wrote that in, I do apologize, I can't find it. But is there, um, uh, if I come to Heidi first, issues around how you feed the children once they're in your care, anything that you'd like to share? Um, yes, I have specifically asked parents not to allow the children to bring food into my setting. Um, I do provide, provide all my uh, meals anyway. Um, and what I've done is I've set up a system. So each child has individual cups, um, crockery, cutlery that is specific to them and only them. And they will use those while they're in my care. Um, they will go straight into a dishwasher on a hot wash following use. Um, before the next meal time, and that's how I've that's how I've implemented my meals policy and within my um, risk assessment. Um, thank you. I've just had a note from Janet that the sound has gone. Can people please reassure me that's Janet's problem, nothing personal, uh, just by sticking their hands up that it's actually just not us that has gone completely silent. Annette, thank you for the reassurance. That's very kind. Barbara, very kind. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm all good. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, now, one that is going to is the money. If I can just move us on, what about charging parents who have been serving before, but they are choosing not to bring their children here, and that will also lead on to um, the situation of having the demand being lower as we start to open up. Um, I'll, I'll come to. I'll come to. Um, Sarah first in terms of personal experience around what you did around charging for those who've chosen not to be around and then I'll open it up to the panel. I think there's two considerations. First is what does your contract say? Or what are the con what do they does it say that parents pay when they don't attend if you're open? And the other consideration is what can the parents afford? Uh, so as well as looking at the contract, obviously, and checking the terms and conditions, you want to be talking to each family and asking them where they're at at the moment. Is it affordable? We don't know the pressures on people's incomes. We don't know if they're on short working, if they've been made redundant, if they're on 80 percent furlough, if then if they're self-employed like us, they may not be earning at all. So I've tried to be very flexible with all my families and taken it on very much a case by case basis. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Heidi, anything to add? And before I make a couple of comments and come to Melanie, um, I think I'd agree with Sarah. You have to you have to communicate with your parents. You have to find a balance that's right for your business and for your parents. If you're, you know, up until now, while we were forced closed, um, I've personally asked my parents for a voluntary retainer, only a very nominal one, and they've been happy to pay that. I know that's not the case for everybody, but if you are open for business and up and running, I would follow what your contract says. Um, but don't, maybe not expect the full payment, but certainly talk to the parents and keep that communication open. Uh, Melanie, to, anything to add before I'm, I'm No, I can only endorse. I can only endorse what's been said. Really, that this really is down to the individuals involved and negotiating with the parents as well. Um, just in terms of the funding situation, um, you're, you will be aware that the expectation from DfE is that local authorities continue to pay the funded rate for children where they um, receive uh, free entitlement, funded entitlement. Um, somebody's had a question of how far does that go forward? Um, my understanding, and I'm, I'm conscious others may have more up-to-date information on this, is that we were taking the, I think it was February was the month that was taken as the norm and that until we hear otherwise, the expectation is that will continue. Um, the other thing that we are expecting is, is a transition funding framework that we know we are aware that DfE is working with the Treasury on which recognizes that the demand one it assumes that demand for early years provision across the sector will be lower because of parental anxiety because of parents still being furloughed all those factors and so there's a recognition that our funding mechanism is different for school than schools. We're not funded on profile a number of places. We're funded on attendees. And so there is work being done 
um, to to support the transition to an opening up provision. But I don't have any more detail, and we don't have any date yet when that will be published. Is there anything, um, Heidi? Is there anything that, uh, or Sarah? That, uh, so, uh, Heidi first, and then Sarah. If there's anything else that you've picked up locally from your local authorities on what they're planning to do. Um, no, we've had little or no communication from our local authority. Um, I do know that they have paid the funding up until the end of the summer term, um, or they've certainly paid the first instalment. Whether or not the second instalment will also be paid, I think people are still waiting. I personally don't have any funded children at this time, so I've not been involved in that, but maybe Sarah could give you a bit more information. Hi, yes, we've we've had our first payment. We're waiting for our second payment. I think it's due next week. Um, so we're all waiting with bad breath for that. We've um, not been given any information about September yet, except a reminder to parents to renew their codes. Right, so it's almost business as usual in that situation then. Mm, seems to be. Yes, yeah, seems to be. <clears throat> um, there's a question that's come in from Debbie and it's one that I'm going to acknowledge that I don't know the answer to so I'll take back to our funding experts. In terms of funding, what happens if shared care is not allowed? The local authority might claw back when they said at the beginning they pay twice. Um, there's a level of technical detail there Debbie that if you don't mind I will park that question and I will make sure that it gets responded to on, the, on our Q&A site on the website unless there's anything particular that um, Sarah or Heidi have about uh, knowledge about those information that in situation. I think because you, the DFE have you turned on so many things, people are just nervous, and we yeah. do need proper clarification. Um, yeah, I will have is, to state yeah. at this point that that is the view of an individual and not necessarily the view of the Alliance. <laughs> um, exactly. Just to cover my own back and keep the lawyers happy. Thank you. I, I think certainly for a lot of childbinders, the funding is what has been able to keep their business going so therefore a lot of childbinders are worried that should that funding have to be paid back or they're not going to be paid for any future funding is is very worrying for a lot of them but much better put than i did how you thank you <laughs> <laughs> um moving on to let's focus on some some of the special things about what we actually build and we had some question in terms of what would we be suggesting in terms of activities for the children and in terms of the whole issues of risk of transmission? There were particular questions about water play, about dry pasta being used as a play implement. Just your experience, please. I'll come to uh, Heidi first. In terms of have you been restricted in the types of activities you would normally do with the children because of the additional transmission risk? Um, I think up till now, because my um, key worker children have played outside, I mean, we are very fortunate that we've had fantastic weather. So they've been allowed, you know, they've been able to go out and play on the bigger equipment and with the mud kitchen that we have. Um, but when I have enforced a, a risk assessment for when I bring in other children, um, and I think, yes, I will not necessarily restrict the toys, but certainly set up activities where the dried pasta example you gave Michael that they would have their own little pot of dried pasta it wouldn't right. be all over the table as on the floor and everywhere else where like it usually is um you know and I know Sarah and I were talking the other day about arts and crafts activities you could put together a little individual box where they've got their own crayons or their own pens their own paper um, and so they're not chopping and changing or swapping pens or I want that colour, I, you know, you have this colour. Um, and just try, I mean, a lot of it is common sense. You have to put, you know, you know, is it Lego? It's great because you can just shove it in the dishwasher, you know, water play. I don't see any problem with water play. Just put lots of soap in. I mean, that, you know, it's um, it works both ways. Um, the question that came back on that one was, in addition to the water, what about a sand pit? Um, Sarah, do you have a sand pit? We do have a sand pit. It's full of sand flies at the moment, so that's got to go. We're going to have individual trays. I bought some cat litter trays from Tesco for about £1.20 each, so nice and shallow, just deep enough to make to do mark making in your sand, to put some damp sand in, some sand mousse, some dry sand sand with sand pencil, whatever we want to do. And if it just the child can use it, they can cough in their own sand and then we can discard it into the garden at the and end of the day. 
Fantastic. And we bought two Thank big you. bags of sand from B&M Bargains very cheaply as well at the weekend, so there's plenty to go around. Thank I'm you. hoping, Michael, you're going to come to me as well because you must um, know that I want to say That's my next port of call, Melanie, please, yes. Okay, so what my advice would be is that um, I would suggest that you would suspend the activities that you would normally suspend if you had an outbreak of V and V, diarrhea and vomiting in your setting, in, in your home, you know, with the cohort of children you're looking after, because um, it is a respiratory infection, so it is transferred by droplets. I think the idea of having an individual sand tray is brilliant. I would suggest that water play you go down the same route with or have running water. So I, I've heard of people who've had the hose pipe out and children, you know, spraying each other. But I would urge caution with, with the water play. And I definitely suggest that anything Play-Doh, sand, water, if you can't do that as a solo activity and that just seems so harsh, for children who are such social creatures, um, then I would suggest you think about it carefully. Thank you. Just one, and I'm, I'm conscious of, I'm just conscious of time. One that's coming from Sandy, and it was about linked to the whole transition thing, and it's reference to the issue that was said that every child above the age of five who's exhibiting uh, symptoms now can be tested. The guidance says parents of under five should call 111, but doesn't say if they will be tested. How will we know if the children? Um, are positive or not and and I don't know Sarah how what's your interpretation of this my understanding is that they're going to be making tests available to under fives because then if they get a negative result they can get straight back into childcare and the parents can get straight back to work so my understanding was they were working on that within the same time scales as returning to provision thank you um, and it's what, I'll take the next one because I'm, I'm conscious of the time and um, starting to wrap things up a bit. Uh, Melanie, we've had somebody who said they're very anxious and they are really thinking about not opening on the 1st of June. Do they have to? No, they absolutely do not have to open on the 1st of June. This is down to you. This is your decision to come back when you are ready, when you're confident, and when it works for you and for the children that are looking for places, so no. Thank you. Um, we're, we're getting loads of questions in in terms of the activities, and I think all I'm going to say is it's back to that point around you know your provision, you know your children, and this is about, as Melanie has said, in terms of think about how you would treat any other risks of infection and what you would do there. So this is about us being professional and having a good understanding of our children, etc. The one comment, if I can find it, I would like to go back to, just to finish this part before I go back to Melanie for a few uh, final bits of information. It was 1833, you, you see this is live now, I'm trying to um, find it as I go through. And it was a lovely phrase from Sarah Higgs. Her, from my experience, if you already have a good working partnership with your parents, they will continue to trust you and take all possible steps to keep their, and know that you will take all possible steps to keep their children safe. I think my comment, thank you that, for that, Sarah, that's, that's ideal because this is around building on the professionalism, the knowledge and experience and skills that you have, and that will reflect in what you do now to address these challenges, um, and also um, how we will build the sector back as we open up. That will be my comment there. Um, Melanie, can I take you back just to summarize through the few final slides before I start to wrap us up, please? Of course, okay. so. I won't keep you too long on this. If I can make slides move again, it's doing that thing where it's stuck again. Okay, right, I'm just gonna talk you through it, Michael, briefly. <laughs> if we, um, yes, it hasn't moved, it's uh, for some reason. Okay, just to let you know then everybody that we have created a series of welcome back resources and in the first instance we made these available to preschools, full daycare and so on. I am combining those resources to make a specific pack for child minders in the hope that some of the templates and ideas that I've put in there will be helpful to you as well. We will be doing future webinars. Um, 
focusing on the child from day one of their return to your provision, which um, you would be very welcome to, to join us for. And also, um, we have our EduCare resources that are available to you, as you know, free um, online training for those of you that are members. And also Smart PD, which is our tailored information, advice and guidance that you can actually access. And you'll see details of how to get hold of all these things on the slides. Um, I would have loved to have shown you um, a, a, an example of a template by card. So with that, Michael, I think I'm just going to hand back over to you and uh, say sorry, the slides are stuck. Uh, yeah, well, we, we need to clean your keypad, I think, probably rather than disinfecting everything. I'm putting the... the new laptop. Thank you. Yeah, new laptop. Okay, we can talk about that offline. Um, right. Um, the, the, the resources are available through the Early Years Alliance website, uh, which is www.eyalliance.org.uk. Um, and you'll, you'll, you'll see all the list on there. Um, as I've said before, we will email out copies of this sli these slides to everybody who was registered, and also the uh, the recording will be available. I know a few people in their local areas have had dips out of sound, so I would ask people to uh, to listen to the recording uh -huh. again. Um, oh, well done, Melanie. Thank you. Um, there we go. I'm so, Right, the, the things are moving again. I mean, it just remains for me to say that's been a fascinating hour. Thank you so much to everybody who has sent in their questions. I hope it's been valuable to you all. And it just remains for me to say thank you so much um, to Sarah Neville and to Heidi Stewart for joining, for giving up their time to join Melanie and myself today uh, and to wish you all the best as you plan for the opening up of your provision. And I suggest you go and enjoy the evening before the clap at eight o'clock for NHS and care workers and essential workers. Thank you so much. I will close the webinar down for everybody. In fact, Melanie will, because you're the chair, please. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>